tonight, we visit Tulum in County Galway to examine what might have happened at the former mother and baby home. What do we know about the treatment of women and children there? And are their stories replicated in other homes around the country? Also, how a doctor sanctioned by the Medical Council for Professional Misconduct in multiple cases is now the subject of a new complaint. The surprise to me is that one doctor can, over such a short period of time, create so many accidents. Hello and welcome to Prime Time. The government today began examining how to investigate the treatment of mothers and babies at a home in Tume in County Galway. Calls for an inquiry have been growing amid claims that up to 800 babies were buried in what used to be a septic tank. Tonight we examine the known facts about the Tume mother and baby's home and ask what should happen next. First Prime Time's Mark Coughlin has this report. <laughs> We've long known the stories of the Magdalen laundries, industrial schools and clerical abuse. But in the last couple of days, another element of Ireland's past has come into the spotlight. Already reviews have been announced and concerns expressed. All this has come off the back of a story about a site which has gone global. The remains of 800 babies and young children. This little plot back here is the site that the whole world seems to be talking about for the last couple of days. It's at the back of a playground behind a housing estate in Shum County, Galway. We've certainly heard a lot about it, but what exactly is it that we know about it? Catherine Corliss is the woman whose research has sparked this story. It just dawned on me to go to the births, deaths and marriages in Galway and see is there, is there a death record there for these children. I specifically asked her for, for the deaths of children who died there. So um, she came back to me a couple of weeks later and she said, I have, uh, I have a very sad story for you. She said, there is a huge amount of children who died at that home. She gave me a, a list of names that uh, numbered 796 in all. This is the full Catherine list. Corliss heard of the existence of the site during her research. She also learned of two men who, as boys, had happened upon a hollow concrete area. They recalled that the concrete area contained bones. Skulls piled up top of each other. That was in 1975, 14 years after the home had closed and four years after the building of the housing estate had begun. One day myself and my mate were there and when we jumped off the wall we felt a hollow and the hollow was a concrete slab that broke and underneath the slab there was skeletons in what at the time I described as a tank but now it was probably would be described as a tomb but there was more than one skeleton. Now, we didn't count or we didn't realise the enormity of what was going on at, at, at that time. The site that Franny and his friend found was soon blessed, he says, by a local priest before being covered over. A few years later, some local people took it upon themselves to restore the area. For the next 30 years, they manicured it and tended to it. It became known locally as the home baby's graveyard. As Catherine Corliss continued her research, she wondered where the 796 babies listed as dying in the home over 40 years were buried. That's the map, that's the map of 1892 map of Chum. So I found an old map of, uh, of the area of Chum, an 1892 map, and uh, it shows where the home is, and also it shows where uh, the septic tank is in relation to the home. Prior to being a mother and baby home, the site was a famine workhouse. Catherine put a map from workhouse times under a map of the home. The workhouse sewage pit matched the site of the burial plot listed on the map beside the mother and baby home. She then went to a Galway County Council archivist who checked the names of about 100 babies provided from her list of 796 against local cemetery records. She checked the, the cymmetries around the area, like Abbey Knockby, Belclear, the, the, you know, all the cemeteries that, that are around the general area within a radius, but not one child appeared in any of the surrounding cemeteries. 
Local media picked up on the story when Catherine published her research last October. She hoped to raise funds to erect a proper memorial to the home babies. It's one of those local stories that uh, suddenly wakes up and takes legs. We've been covering it since certainly last October. I suspect that what's new about it is that it appeared in a National Sunday newspaper and um, all of a sudden a lot of speculation yes. and stories emerge. You know, the concept of a mass grave, I think, is an extremely emotive term. Do I honestly believe that there was an interment in the mass grave? I would like not to believe that, but I'm trying to comprehend this over the last couple of weeks. And the way I would say it is that maybe during the, the building of this estate that there was graves disturbed and that the war kind of piled into a pile and just then turned in a corner to get on with the building. Do you have any concerns that the 12-year-old boys said that there was a lot of skulls, mm -hmm. you've 796 death certs and yes. there's a septic tank, but do you have any concerns that they might not necessarily add together to make the sum of the well, pictures well, that uh, exist now? Well, OK, Mark, where would they be if they're not in that pit? Where, where would they be? As someone said, have they just vanished into thin air? Where else would they be is a very reasonable question. We know from a primetime report in 2011 that the bodies of many hundreds of babies who died in certain mother and baby homes were used for anatomical research in Irish universities. We also know it was sadly not unusual for babies in such homes to be buried in unmarked graves. We don't know for sure as yet anyway. If the babies who died in the tomb home were buried in a septic tank, no burial location is listed on the death records. Tomb happens to be the example of the moment, but there are bound to be others. Um, we dealt with mothers who had children out of wedlock in a most shameful way, and of course, the home was closed in 1961. There, were, there are women who are bound to be still alive who went through that trauma, and I certainly think that there should be a redress scheme for them because they were very ill-served by, by Irish society, church and state, and the general community. We asked the nuns order who ran the home to respond to the reports of a mass grave in Tume. They said in a statement they were happy to participate in any investigation. Unquestionably, many lives and deaths in mother and baby homes across the country were horrific. The question now being asked is what the review announced yesterday might yet uncover. That was Mark Coughlin reporting there, and I'm joined now from London by Sally Mulready. Sally is founder and chairperson of mm -hmm. the Irish Women Survivors and Support Network. And here in Dublin by Lindsay Erner Byrne, Dr. Lindsay Erner Byrne, UCD historian and author. And Lindsay, if I could start with you on this, I mean, were you surprised when you heard these reports of a, a mass grave in Chewham in County Galway? Well, obviously, of a mass grave, yes, but um, the numbers, no. Um, I mean, we have known for quite some time that the death rate in these homes was extraordinarily high um, at any one time between <coughs> 35 and 61 percent. Um, in fact, uh, how did that compare then to what was happening outside of these homes? Uh, well, um, all the homes, the county homes, so th which were the erstwhile workhouses, which is actually where the Tume home comes from. Um, and same with the home in Pelletstown, the Navan Road, and then there was another one in Kilrush. And then there were special mother and baby homes, which is Bespera, um, uh, Sean Ross Abbey and Ross Cray. But all of the homes shared that, that um, common trait of very high infant mortality rates, significantly higher than the mortality rate for legitimate babies. And this was something, by the way, that was commented on from the foundation of the state. The very first Registrar General's report in 1922 commented on the fact that the infant mortality rate for illegitimate children in institutions was five times higher than for legitimate children. And that was one of the reasons why they introduced the Maternity Inspection Act of 1934 deliberately to try and cut down on, on, to reduce that infant mortality and it was obviously a notorious failure. So did we find out why the mortality rate was so high in these places? Among the, among the children were institutionalised, one of the main theories at the time was the spread of gastroenteritis, infectious diseases am among these children. So if you had an outbreak of something like gastroenteritis and these children were in these small little cots all lined up together, sometimes more than one child in a cot, those infections just spread incredibly quickly through the wards. Also things like measles, any of those sort of epidemic diseases would spread very quickly. And became um, fatal then. Became very fatal very quickly. And the medical attention was not always as it should have been in these homes. Pelletstown was quite well serviced in terms of medical personnel and nurses but some of the special homes as they were called were actually quite poorly uh, catered for in terms of medical care. And is there anything that you've seen thus far in relation to the Tune mother and baby home that would say there was an exceptionally high mortality rate no, there? No. In fact 
the highest, the one that, that seems to feature constantly in the records as having an exceptionally high rate would have been Bespera, which at one point had a 61% death rate. Uh, Tune was always very high, don't get me wrong. I mean, even right into the late and uh, mid-1940s, they were coming in at a de an official death rate of 25%, which means one, one in every four babies dying. This is unbelievable mm -hmm. death rate, even at the time when infant mortality was higher than it now is. OK, I want to come to um, Sally now. Sally, we know that you work with women who have been through um, these these homes and indeed through personal experience your own family your own mother went through yeah. uh, two of these homes I mean yeah. how does the tomb story tally with your family's personal experience and those experiences of the women you speak to on a daily basis well sadly very closely um, in, in, in terms of my mother's story it's interesting that the um, comment on um, Besborough uh, one of my mothers my mother had two uh, children before myself and my brother who survived and um, one was born in Besborough in 1939 and actually in 1939 even the Department of Health or the equivalent of the Department of Health uh, wrote to Besborough expressing concern about the high level of deaths in Besborough in 1939. Uh, my mother was only 19, uh, her child survived two months. Um, she also had a child in um, uh, home in Dublin, I can't remember, a mother and baby home in Dublin, um, who, who also died. Um, in, in that instance, the, the child wasn't buried or put into an incinerator, but was actually given over to Trinity College for uh, students to study. Uh, I appreciate that students have to study, especially medical students, but it was that, without my mother's consent, and they held the child for two years. That was common practice, though, wasn't it, as we heard in, in, in that report? Well, I understand that o over 400 uh, ch children uh, were given away in this way, taken from uh, an range of um, mother and baby homes. But um, if I could get back to the, um, the, the, the story about the, the 800, um, you know, my, my first reaction when I heard it, and I want to say this on behalf of women who were, like myself, the children of uh, mothers who were in mother and baby homes, and women out there who are the mothers of uh, deceased and dead uh, babies, that, um, that the story of, of, of Tum, you know, it's heartbreaking. It, 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 you know, it eats at our sorrow and our, you know, how we, how we feel and stuff that you've kind of buried for a long time. But we're very glad it's come out. And over the two days of listening to it, as the story became bigger and bigger and as more and more information came out, I kind of felt, my God, they nearly got away with this. Um, you know, Ireland thought a few babies here and a few babies there uh, died in these modern baby homes. Sally, but the scale of it though, is just do, do incredible. You, do you not think, though, that the information in many ways, you know, we heard Lindsay talking about the mortality rate and we knew what was going on in these homes. Do you not think it's not a question of the story coming out as such? It's the fact that we're paying attention to it now for some reason. And we weren't before. Well, I, I suppose the scale of it, 800 infants dying and being buried and being put in incinerators and, and all, all the, the manner in which they, their bodies were disposed of, I suppose the scale of that is kind of really touching people. Um, but, you know, people I know, women in particular, who've been through this, have been hurting for years. Um, and I think it's really important that we don't now start looking to blame. Blame will not ease the pain. Um, blame will not make the hurting go away. Mm -hmm. I could have been one of those children, very, very easily been one of those children. What we now need is that inquiry that everybody's talking about. Okay. But I think we need to give the new minister a chance to, um, you know, to, to do what he says he's going to do, look at it and take it seriously. Okay, and, um, that's, and, that's and most importantly, Flanagan. I think that we need to just take, take stock of all the other inquiries that we had, the, you know, the, the Ryan report, the Murphy report, and all the other reports, and make sure that we don't make the all same right. mistakes uh, in terms of how we investigate that we did then. Sorry, I just want to come back um, briefly, Lindsay, to you. Okay. What do you think should happen now? What needs to happen, do you think? Well, I agree that there needs to be an inquiry. We need to find out about, this, in this case, the specific babies, the 800 babies, but also what was the practice in other homes in terms of burial. 
Um, but in terms of the, of the high infant mortality rate, we know that. We have that record and that 800 number will be replicated and higher in all the other homes. I mean, we can add them up from the years. They're all on public record. But I do think that the, the, the women who went through those homes, um, the mothers of these children and their families, have a right to know what happened to them. Um, and, and I agree that we have to also start joining all these dots together. This is the same society as institutionalised children in industrial schools till they were 16. It is the same society that sent mothers to Magdalen homes and it's the same society that is still not properly taking care of vulnerable children. Okay, thank you very much. Lindsay Erna Byrne and Sally Mulready in London. Now it's over to David. We often have little choice but to trust the medical profession as our lives are literally in their hands. And usually that trust is more than repaid. But what happens when it's not? Do the authorities involved do enough to ensure that doctors found guilty of professional misconduct don't pose a continuing danger to patients? We'll be asking the Medical Council those questions. But first, Aoife Hegarty of RTE's Investigations Unit has this report. The Medical Council is the regulatory body for doctors here. Its primary role is to protect the public by ensuring high standards of conduct, training and competence among doctors. It investigates complaints and when necessary imposes sanctions on a doctor's practice. Given the chaotic condition of the health service and the fact that it's in crisis, that role is never more important than it is now. Tonight, we examine a doctor who has repeatedly made mistakes. The surprise to me is that one doctor can, over such a short period of time, create so many accidents. And how the Medical Council has responded. Medical Council just slap you on the wrist and say, don't let it happen again. I don't even have enough power. I have to have that using it. Sandra O'Connor had two daughters with her husband, Martin. It was all about her girls. They were the be all and end all. Great mother, great wife, great friend. She set this vision out for us when she was 16 of where we're going to end up, and we did. She always had to be positive. Like every morning we go to school, she'd brush her hair, tie it up. We'd go outside to the car and she'd make us stop, close her eyes, and listen to the birds. Yeah. Just a really happy person. Shortly after Christmas 2005, Sandra went to a private clinic for a routine day procedure. Sandra underwent the same operation on two previous occasions because of recurrent cysts on her ovaries. The rest of the time she had her operation, she was out that evening, picked her up, no problems. I took a day off work. Brought her in for seven, um, kissed her goodbye, said see you later. About 12 o'clock had a phone call saying she was a bit sick, um, but she, so she, they were going to keep her in. Over the following days, Sandra's condition worsened. She continued to vomit. Pains developed in her abdomen that weren't alleviated with painkillers. Her temperature was high, causing a fever. You assume the doctor knows what they're doing, that they're going to look after her. So I went off home happy enough, rang her that, e that evening again at 10ish. She never answered the phone. Sandra O'Connor's consultant gynaecologist was Dr Andrea Herman. The following morning, Martin was called to her office. Dr Herman had carried out Sandra's operation and cared for her in the previous days. Dr Herman told me there was a problem with Sandra, she had to do a second operation. and. She said she'd done an ICU, but she's recovering. She'd be, she'd still be, said she'd be fine. So I had her up down to ICU. I looked at the woman in the bed and didn't know who she was. And I said to her, I asked one of the nurses, where's Sandra Connor? And she goes, that's her behind you. And I used her to bed and things weren't right. A few hours later, Sandra suffered multiple organ failure, followed by a cardiac arrest causing severe brain damage. Sandra had septicemia. The infection had gone undetected for days. For the next three years, she was in a semi-vegetative state. She didn't just lie there staring at the ceiling. She followed us in the room, she followed us. 
but I think she might have recognised us, but there was nothing she could do. She couldn't talk to us. I'd hate to think that she knew and she couldn't communicate. That'd be worse. I would put cream on her hands and brush her hair and do what I could. You sit there and talk to her, but like obviously we wouldn't have anything back, but just to like still tell her everything that was going on. On February 19th, 2008, three years after what should have been a routine day procedure, 42-year-old Sandra O'Connor died from pneumonia. I breathed a huge sigh of relief, because it was finally over for her. It was over for all of us, but mainly her. She has no more pain. Following Sandra's death, her husband Martin had a medical expert review the case. The expert concluded that if Sandra had been administered a simple broad-spectrum antibiotic, on the balance of probabilities, her subsequent deterioration would have been averted. In other words, Sandra would have survived. She failed to administer antibiotics. That's what it boils down to. She left her in a bed for four days while she got sicker and sicker. We asked Dr. Herman for an interview. She declined. But in a phone call, she said the care provided was not good and that she is so sorry for what happened and that her life has never been the same afterwards. We are aware of four other civil cases that have successfully settled against Dr. Herman without an admission of liability. And we know of at least another four cases which are ongoing. Dr. Roger Clements has offered expert opinion in a number of cases. The surprise to me is that one doctor can, over such a short period of time, create so many accidents. I've now reported on six cases, and whilst I do a lot of cases for the Irish courts and I see an awful lot of mistakes made, there are only one or two doctors who recur with this much frequency. In 2009, a complaint was made to the Medical Council. The complaint related to the care of eight women who were all patients of Dr. Herman. The Medical Council held a fitness to practice inquiry. Not every allegation made against Dr. Herman was proven. However, they made specific findings including that Dr. Herman failed to conduct any or adequate examinations of the patient, failed to appreciate the gravity of the patient's condition, failed to take appropriate steps prior to undertaking surgery, and failed to apply appropriate standards of clinical judgment. In fact, the inquiry took the view that over the totality of the patients it reviewed, Dr. Herman seriously fell short of the standards expected from a consultant gynaecologist. And on that basis, professional misconduct was established across all eight cases. Following Dr. Andrea Herman's fitness to practice inquiry, the Medical Council suspended her for one year. On her return to work, conditions were attached to her practice, including retraining and supervision. I was surprised that the sanction was relatively m modest, uh, given the number of cases and the severity of the one that I knew about. The O'Connor family also believed the sanctions were not strict enough. Medical Council just slap you on the wrist and say, don't let it happen again. I don't even have enough power, or I have to have, not using it. The, the sanctions weren't close to enough. For me, she should have been suspended for life. We asked the Medical Council for an interview, but they declined, saying they were legally restricted from commenting on individual cases. They went on to say they sympathise with anyone who suffers tragic loss or injury and understand the frustration that may be experienced. Dr. Herman's sanctions included the need to develop a professional plan to address deficiencies in her practice. She was also required to receive supervision. I would have thought that can really only happen in the context of a teaching hospital. 
and there are plenty of teaching hospitals in Ireland who could undertake the task. But I understand that in this case, it was done in a district general hospital. We've learned of another case involving Dr. Herman, which happened as recently as December last, while she was still under sanction and working at Sligo Regional Hospital. The woman affected did not wish to be interviewed as she is too upset. Her solicitor spoke on her behalf. She was scheduled to have a, a caesarean section. On the date of her discharge, the doctor explained that a mistake had occurred. The mistake resulted in a longer than normal uh, incision. The scar was crooked and the doctor explained it by suggesting that the bed was incorrectly tilted and that the drapes were uh, crookedly applied. An expert report on the incident states that Dr. Herman created a wound in the wrong place and the fact that it slopes downwards into the crease of the groin causes such discomfort and distress. He concludes saying the performance of the C-section was careless and resulted in unnecessary harm, pain and suffering to the patient. In all of his time, both as a, an expert and as a practitioner, he never witnessed a scar like this one. The particular patient subsequently discovers the history of this particular doctor, she finds that extremely troubling and it has added to her trauma. If the doctor continues to make the same sorts of errors uh, within the uh, retraining process, it says two things. It says, first of all, that they're not being adequately supervised. And secondly, it suggests that they're not learning very quickly. In a written statement, Dr Andrea Herman said she is working within the sanctions of the Medical Council and is stringently adhering to them. But it's not just Ireland where restrictions were placed on her practice. Dr Herman failed to inform the UK's General Medical Council that her practice was restricted in Ireland. Because she is registered in the UK, she must inform them of findings made against her. The GMC held a fitness to practice inquiry in 2012. They found Dr. Herman's fitness to practice is impaired by reason of misconduct. And in view of the serious nature of the findings against Dr. Herman and the concerns about patient safety, that it is necessary for the protection of the public to impose immediate conditions. These conditions will remain on Dr. Herman's history indefinitely, where they are publicly available on the GMC Register of Doctors. This is in complete contrast to the system in operation here. When Dr. Herman's sanction period ends, she can then apply to have her conditions removed from the Medical Register. If she satisfies the council that they may safely be removed, her history will no longer be available to the public. There are some things which, uh, in a doctor's background, that it would be important that they were there permanently so that when patients were choosing them as their doctor, they would know about that. Employers um, and prospective employers will want to see the full history of a doctor, not just a partial history. And why shouldn't a patient, a prospective patient, have access to exactly the same information? Following our investigation, we received a statement from the HSE saying Dr. Herman has submitted her resignation to Sligo Regional Hospital. The HSE added that reviews into complaints can continue even when an individual has left the hospital. While Dr. Herman left her employment last week, she can continue to practice medicine. That report by Aoife Hegarty. Well, yesterday the Medical Council agreed to talk to us and I'm joined now in studio by Caroline Spillane, Chief Executive of the Council. Caroline Spillane, um, the Council found uh, Dr Herman guilty of professional misconduct in multiple cases, but you only suspended her for one year. Now, we saw uh, Roger Clemens there in the report saying he was surprised at the modest sanction. I think most viewers won't, will be more than surprised. They'll be shocked. 
Uh, so, David, um, I think, first of all, uh, I think it's important for me to state that um, I can only comment on certain matters here that are in the public domain. Yeah, well, this is in the public domain. And for matters that were raised in, in the tape that um, might be before the Medical Council, I can't comment on those. Um, but I'll, I'll try to deal with matters as best I can. Um, I, I suppose first thing to say that um, in respect of Mr O'Connor, I think it's very, um, it's very understandable that he is angry and that he is upset particularly given the terrible circumstances that that family find themselves in. But I think it's important also to state that the Medical Council does uh, act in the public interest and we act in a proportionate fashion. Well, is it proportionate to impose a, 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 a suspension of one year in a case like this, where there's repeated cases of professional misconduct? So, um, if I might just have a, have a moment to state what the process that the Medical Council uses is. When the Medical Council receives a complaint about a doctor, it investigates that complaint mm. very thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And it does this, um, and it may lead to an inquiry, what which is what happened in this circumstance. A finding was made of professional misconduct in the same instance as in the GMC, and um, a suspension of one year was, um, was deemed to be appropriate. But and that, conditions that, I'm sorry, were, that, that is my, the point yeah. I'm trying to get across. I mean, we saw Martin O'Connor there. Mm -hmm. he, we saw him say that the suspension should have been for life, not for one year. And a lot of people watching will agree with him. That's right. And, uh, Dr. Herman went to the High Court and appealed the Medical Council's suspension of one year and the nine conditions that we attached to her registration. And in the High Court, the High Court said that this was a proportionate measure. And the High Court, uh, in addition to that, uh, imposed the conditions that the Medical Council had recommended. But the, the High Court made one change. And the High Court, and I think it's relevant to the tape that you played earlier, the change that the High Court made was that it determined that where the Medical Council had asked that Dr. Herman be placed in a, in a post in a teaching hospital, the High Court said that that was unjust and unfair well, and revised my, that My condition. understanding of it is that they, 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 it was a technical decision about the type of post rather than about the type of hospital. And my understanding further is that the Council still had the power to approve the consultant involved, so therefore you could have insisted on approving a consultant who was in a teaching hospital. Well, the, the High Court ha had said very clearly that the uh, sanction imposed by the Medical Council of one year was proportionate and revised that condition. But as it stands at present, uh, Dr. Herman has served her suspension, but the conditions are still imposed on her registration, which means that she. But sorry, to get back to the point that you raised yourself about the, the teaching hospital, mm -hmm. I mean, in other jurisdictions, this is best practice. Something like this has to be carried out in a teaching hospital where there's a large volume of cases. It stands to reason. So why did the Medical Council not insist on a proven a consultant in a teaching hospital. The Medical Council insisted that Dr. Herman would be under the supervision of a consultant, a senior medical practitioner. And but not in a teaching hospital. Because the High Court determined that this was unjust and unfair. But I'm and not sure that they determined that the hospital was unjust and, and unfair. They determined that the particular post that uh, the Medical Council uh, insisted upon uh, wasn't fair because such a post doesn't actually exist. So you could still, surely, have insisted on a consultant in a teaching hospital. Those kinds of posts do exist, but the point that the High Court was making, and of course the High Court is the ultimate supervisor of the Medical Council's work, the, the point that the High Court was making was that if Dr. Herman was put into this position, that it effectively would be erasure by the back door and that Dr. Herman would be precluded from practicing. And, the, and, so even that, it, so th and that's how she ended up in Sligo Regional Hospital. And in that case... You had no power to insist on a consultant in a teaching hospital. Is that what you're saying to me? We had to operate along the lines that the High Court had determined. Um, so basically now the situation is she's left her current position, but if she finds an employer to take her on either here or abroad, you're quite happy for her to continue practising. Well, the, the conditions that are attached to Dr. Herman mean that she can only operate um, and practise in a hospital. She cannot practise privately. She must practise under the supervision of a named consultant, and that consultant has to be approved by the Medical Council. We. And, and so you could have insisted on approving a, a consultant in a teaching hospital? We, we, we operate along the lines of what the, the High Court has determined, and that the High Court determined that Dr. Herman should operate underneath the supervision of a named consultant that was acceptable to the Medical Council. So and you could have insisted that the acceptable consultant was a consultant in a teaching hospital? That's the point I'm trying to make to you. Yes. You could have. So why didn't you? 
I understand that's the point you're trying to make to me and I'm trying to describe to you how the conditions operate at present. So right now if Dr Herman was to uh, to to seek to get a position uh, in a hospital in Ireland this would have to be done in compliance with the conditions that are in place and I, 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 one thing to, to, to point out those conditions will stay in place until Dr Herman has satisfied them and if Dr Herman isn't satisfying those conditions well then the Medical Council will take action uh, and it would do that in respect of any doctor who had conditions but wasn't adhering to those conditions uh, okay. to act in the public interest. Okay, Caroline Splan, thank you very much for joining us. Claire. And that's it for tonight. You can keep up to date with the latest news after this programme on RTE News Now. News on 2 is at 10 past 11 tonight. If you'd like to be in our audience next Tuesday night, you can email us primetimeaudience at rte.ie or telephone Dublin 208 3494. For now, though, from myself, David, and everyone on the team, thanks for watching and a very good night. Well, there's drama in The Good Wife here on One later at 11.20. But up next, a fly in the wall documentary as people share their lives from Belfast City Hall. More details on that in just a few moments.